Morning all, good to see you all. You're well. Okay, um, today I'm going to, I finished my series on the blueprint and um, so today I'm just going to do a, a little one-off sermon called I Shall Build My Temple, not me personally, this is Jesus who will build his temple uh, and uh, yeah, that's what it's called, I Shall Build My Temple. So if you've all got your Bibles with you, if you'd like to open your Bible to Zechariah chapter 6, it's near the end of your Old Testament, uh, Zechariah chapter 6 and verses 12 to 13 and then keep your finger there because we'll keep looking at that verse throughout. Um, so Zechariah 6, verses 12 to 13. And what we're going to do today, the first half, we're going to cover a little bit of theology. Okay, so don't switch off. All right, this is important stuff. And then the second half, we'll get to um, what is Jesus saying to his church today. Um, hopefully, if we get through it. Okay, everyone got that? Yeah, so Zechariah 6, 12 to 13. It says, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honour and shall sit and rule on his throne. Now, as when we look at a passage like this, the question we need to be asking ourselves, well, who is the branch? Now, I know you all know the answer to that, right? The answer is... Yeah, only one knows. Jesus, okay? Jesus is obviously the branch. But obviously we need to qualify. That's all very well, very well me saying it is Jesus. But we need to know why the scriptures attest the fact that it is Jesus. So I'm just going to push out some scriptures there. Um, you won't have time to look these up, but feel free to write them down if you are taking notes. So in Isaiah 11:1, 1, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jess, Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And this, interestingly, just an aside, links to Revelation 22, 16, which says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll raise to David a branch of the righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And Zechariah 3, 8, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. OK, so it's all quite easy. Um, you'll see this reference used a lot in Scripture. So I'm just highlighting a few here that but this prophesied branch who will build the temple obviously is Jesus himself. Uh, we can also see other mm, kind of illustrations based around the point where Jesus says that he is the vine. OK, uh, so John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Also, this um, this little root, that this little uh, kind of thing, this branch that comes out of the stump of Jesse. OK, it's an Old Testament picture. So, for example, in Daniel chapter four, King Nebuchadnezzar is uh, given this picture that he's this mighty tree. And because he is so powerful and because he's become so arrogant, God is going to chop down his tree and all that's going to be left is a stump. OK, so this is all allegory. So Jesus is going to be this little thing that just starts ever so small and ever so tender. And then one day will become the biggest, chiefest tree in all the world, which means it's his kingdom that has rule and dominion over all the nations. Amen. So. The next thing about this scripture, behold, the man whose name is the branch. So the next thing we need to look at is we can see from this messianic prophecy that obviously that Jesus is the promised Messiah. But that it, but also what we get from Zechariah is that he is the man. So it's here we get a foreglimpse of the coming one who himself will be like a natural man, like you and me. Now, I'm going to emphasize some parts this morning about Jesus' divinity and Jesus' humanity. Why is this important? I'll tell you why it's important. Because there was a survey done and 70% of Christians, 70%, it's actually slightly more, but let's just knock it down a bit, 70% of Christians did not know that Jesus is fully God and fully man. They believed either A, which is the Aryan point of view, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe he's born, he is the son of God, he is divine, but he's not God. He's somehow less than God. That's Arianism. That was decreed as heresy in around about AD 400. Okay, so if you believe that, sorry, you're a heretic. Um, and, then, and then over here, you've got other Christians that, well, believe that Jesus kind of looked human, but he wasn't really human uh, because he was really God. 
but it just kind of like had a human body and the fact that Mary gave birth to him is neither really here nor there. That's a form of Gnosticism that is also heresy, okay? So hopefully <laughs> you don't sit in any of those two camps. And if you do find yourself sat in one of those camps, get out of it quickly, okay? Uh, right, so behold the man who is the branch. Now, this man is no ordinary man. Now, if you know your Bible prophecy, this all wonderfully links up because this man, which scripture keeps prophesying about through Old Testament through to the New Testament, links up to Genesis 3.15, 3, which says, I will put, put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise, he shall bruise your heel. So here we see Jesus is born of the woman, okay, Jesus the man, and Jesus is the prophesied, promised one who would basically come to undo Satan, uh, Satan's kingdom. Okay, now all of this is really important. I'm just going to go off on a little tangent here because this is also really important. So for example, have you ever noticed that Jesus, whenever he talks about his mother, he always calls her woman, a hey, woman, you know, which it, to us is like, dude, you know, you're supposed to be the son of God. That's like a bit rude, isn't it? Um, but actually he's using biblical language when he's referring to his mother. He is calling her the woman because Genesis 3.15, I'll put, put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. You see, this was a prophecy that was given to Eve, but it isn't for Eve because the only woman that ever gave birth to the one that would crush his head and he would bruise his heel was Mary, okay? I know Protestants get a bit funny when you mention the word Mary. It's not Christmas time. I know we can't wheel her out just yet, but okay. So, and uh, yeah, apologize for any Catholics listening to this. But, um, but Jesus called his, his mother woman because he's referring to her title from the Genesis 3.15. You are the woman and through you would come one that you would give birth to one that would crush Satan's head and he would bruise his heel. Uh, now, this is important as well because another thing just on this, because again, I'm talking about Jesus' divinity and Jesus' humanity is that, um, yeah, oh, we'll come back to that another time. I'll come back to that when I get to Jesus in a minute. So when Jesus was, was made in Mary's womb, he took on her DNA, okay? So that's really important because if he didn't take on her DNA, then he could not be born of the line of David. Okay, God doesn't do fudges. He doesn't like, well, she was kind, he was kind of born this way, but he's not really human. He didn't really take on her DNA. He took on her DNA because he cannot be of the line of David if he's physically not of the DNA and descendant of someone who's in the line of David. Okay, I mean, it's common sense, right? So Jesus was born a Jew, and guess what? When he went, to, when he went up to heaven, he's now English. No, he's not. He's still Jewish. He retains his ethnicity and will do so forever because Jesus is the prophesied, promised Jewish king that will one day rule and reign. And he's not going to rule and reign in New York or in Britain. He's going to reign and rule from Israel, from Jerusalem, because he is the Jewish Messiah. OK. And he's also our Messiah but he is Jewish and he got his Jewishness from his mother, which probably meant he looked a bit like his mother. Now, some people are going, no, no, I, I don't agree with that. He, he looked like God, he looked like God. <laughs> All right. He contained the divinity of God, but humanity, he got it from his mother. So he obviously, he might have had her nose, I don't know. Um, you know he's had some issues from her that, that, that looked, like, looked like her. And obviously he took on her DNA because he, be, he literally became fully human. Because if Jesus didn't become fully human, he can't truly be a mediator between God and man. Okay. So the next part I want to talk about is the branch is also fully human. God. Now, some of you might think, why does this matter? But I've already said that Christians do have some goofy ideas when it comes to Jesus. And, and when it comes to the incarnation, a lot of people are quite confused by that. So I want to make this absolutely clear because there are some Christians that believe, yes, Jesus is the son of God. Yes, Jesus is divine, but no, he's not God. OK, so let's see what the scriptures have to say. Now, by the way, I'm just going to give you a little tiny portion of the Bible. Yes, Michael. Um, Joseph. Jesus' legal guardian and father yeah. was also of David's royal line. That's right, yeah. So 
Jesus was completely, totally a Jewish person, and that's sometimes missed. In every respect, he was what God planned for him to be. Yes, that's right. But obviously, if he had a stepdad who was who was Jewish, but his mum, but the issue is he got his humanity not through Joseph, but through Mary, you see. And so, and Mary is, if you look at the two genealogies, they're slightly different because one emphasizes Mary's, because uh, you're not allowed to bring in, it was never, the genealogies never really listed women. So in, the, in one of the genealogies, it lists Mary's father as in the genealogy. So that shows that Mary is of the line of David, whereas the other genealogy points to Joseph. Okay, in case you wondered where the two discrepancies come from, that's what it is. Okay, so Exodus 3.15, God appears to Moses. I think that's what I'm, you're saying, is that right? Yeah, yeah no? but it's just that people don't recognise Jesus' Jewishness. Yes. He's completely a Jewish person. And Absolutely. He fulfilled all the law yeah. of the Jews, yeah. even to the legal extent that he was legally yeah. Okay, right. Everyone else who's got a question? Okay, we'll leave it to the end. Okay, so let's carry on. There's more hands going up. Excuse me. Um, Exodus 3.15. God said to Moses at the burning bush, I am who I am. But then in John 8.58, thousands of years later, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I had a friend who didn't believe that Jesus is God, and he said, ah, yes, Chris, what's happening there is that Jesus is just playing with his verbs and playing with his languages and, and playing with language. And I was like, well, he must have had, like, the verb police out because immediately in the next sentence it says, and they all picked up stones to stone him. And I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that he got his tenses wrong. It had everything to do with the fact that he was claiming to be none other than God himself. OK, so Jesus himself says, hey, guys, I am and they knew exactly what he meant genesis 1 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth john 1 1 in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us matthew 1 23 behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name emmanuel which means god with us OK, John 5, verse 8. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his father, making himself equal with God or equal in English with God. John 20, 27 to 29. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your, out your hand and place it in my side. Gross. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Colossians 2.9, in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells bodily in him. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So Peter is calling Jesus our God and Saviour. All right. OK, now I could give you loads more. But that's just a little sprinkling there just to help you out. I'm sure as Christians, you're all like, yeah, Chris, we know this, but that's fine. But there are a lot that don't. Now, again, Job 9.3.3, Job is like saying, if only there could be one person who could mediate between God and man. Yeah. And then in 1 Timothy 2.5, the answer is, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ. OK, so Jesus is our high priest who is fully human and is fully God. And therefore, he has the full capacity to mediate between man and God because he's both of them at the same time. Amen. Amen. Zechariah 6, 12 to 13. Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honour and shall sit and rule on his throne. Now, why is this verse interesting? One key reason why this verse is very interesting, and you better watch out for this, especially if you're into Hebrew roots theology, OK, and that is this is that the Jews know that the Messiah is coming and when he comes, he's going to build the temple. But the Jews aren't looking for God to come back. They're not looking for that. That is not on their wavelength. OK, I've read Jewish eschatology. This is who they're looking for. They are looking for a man who will build their temple. They're not looking for some supernatural being. They're looking for a man. Okay, 
Now, we know from this scripture and from rabbinical teaching that Jesus, sorry, that the Messiah will build the temple. But the temple that Messiah will build, which is Jesus, is the fourth temple, which is the temple of Ezekiel. The temple which another Messiah will build, which is the pseudo Messiah or the Antichrist, okay, he will build the third temple. And you want to watch out because there are Christians. Okay, I had one lady here, she goes to Israel and she was telling me when she was out in Israel, there are a lot of Christians that believe we're in the millennial reign of Christ now. And, and they don't believe that war or any more things are coming. They believe that Jesus is already here and therefore he's going to rebuild the temple. And they're basically, they are waiting through misguided theology for the rise of the Antichrist. OK, so you've got to be so careful with this stuff because Messiah will build the temple, but he's not going to build it until he fully returns in glory. However, in the meantime, just put that out there, Jesus is also building his other temple, which is the church. OK, 1 Peter 2, 5, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I need to say this as well, because some people are going, oh, but Chris, you know, that's just your interpretation of end times, etc. Well, yeah, I guess there's truth in that, except that that is what the Jews believe, except that's what the early church believed, except that it's written in the early church fathers that the Antichrist will be Jewish and he will be the one that builds the third temple. And, that, and these guys were right at the beginning of the church. They knew apostolic tradition. They knew what the apostles taught. They knew their end time theology. Here we are, 2000 years later, we don't know anything about our history anymore because we've written it off because we're not interested. And we're looking now through the, through the past with our lenses, trying to look back, assuming we think we know what we're talking about. But actually, more often than not, we're not really on it because we don't know our history. The fact is that where it says, Jesus shall rule for a thousand years. This is not a Gentile philosophy. This is not something that come into the church. And this is a Christian idea. This is a Jewish idea. It comes from Judaism. And so the fact that the book of Revelation says it in black and white, that Jesus will rule for a thousand years. It's not a metaphorical thing. The Jews believe it literally. The early church believed it literally. It's only us thousands of years later that wants to question it. Okay, I would rather go with that as my weight of evidence than, than a modern interpretation. So Jesus is the one that branches out. Jesus is building his church, as we know. We are this church, we are this spiritual house, or holy priesthood. And Ephesians 2.20, it says, you, as us, are being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So Jesus is building his church. He's building his temple right now. And you all here are all living stones and a part of that temple, which is cool, isn't it? But Jesus, he is the one that branches out, okay? It says, for he shall branch out of his place. Where did he branch out from? Anywhere else? Got Israel contender there? Any, any other contenders on Israel? Oh, look at that. My wife got the answer. She didn't know this sermon. Gold star, Tracy, for you. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus branches out from heaven because Jesus first left heaven to come to earth. John 3.13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. John 6.38, for I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is an apostle. Where was he sent from? He was apostolized by his father, sent from heaven down onto the earth to go about his mission. OK, so Jesus branched out literally from heaven. But then where else did he branch out from? Let's narrow it down from Israel to a, 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 a geographical location. Any, any guesses? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Oh, look, look, gold star for you. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> OK, right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm just bringing it right to the to the early. But you're right. He did come out of Egypt as well. So John 6:33 says, "For the bread of God 
is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. John 6, 41, therefore the Jews were grumbling about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Matthew 2, verses four to six says, and when he gathered all the chief priests, this is Herod, and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them, where was Christ to be born? And they said, Bethlehem. And what does Bethlehem mean? House of bread. bread. Hallelujah. So the bread basket of Judea, which was Bethlehem, is where the bread from heaven who came down onto the earth was born into the house of bread, that from the house of bread, bread may go out to the nations. How cool is that? Amen. So Jesus will build his temple. It says, it is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honour and shall sit and rule on his throne. Um, and one thing we need to be bringing it back to today now, one thing that we need to be absolutely clear on in these days of apostate Christianity is that Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Maybe over Chris, but the gates of hell are doing a pretty good job at the moment. They are prevailing against the church. Well, they may be doing that in the West, but they're not in the East. Man, the East church is exploding out there. But God has a plan for Britain as well. Matthew 6, 18, 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, in Britain, we've had a, a major decline in Christianity. So in the early 1900s, as in, you know, 1925, that sort of thing, Christianity was at a place where 25 to 30 percent of Great Britain believed in God. Well, not believed in God, but went to church. OK, the statistics now state that less than 10 percent of Great Britain now goes to church. OK, and I'd have to include in that a lot of born again Christians who themselves have disenfranchised themselves from the wider body of Christ as well. They're just at home by themselves. And so that gives you a snapshot of Great Britain today. 90% of Great Britain is now a completely secular and liberal society. Okay, centre, centre liberal and some hard left. But that's the society we now live in. Okay, it's not good news. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labour in vain. Anyone ever feel? I mean, sometimes I do feel like I'm labouring in vain. Um, Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So what is wrong with the church? Well, we have the zeitgeist, which is the spirit of the age in our midst now. Because the church is in a place of worldliness. She's in a place of apathy. And this worldliness and apathy has infiltrated the ranks of Christendom everywhere. Uh, and the, but the key issue, I think, why this nation is going down the pan, anyone would like to guess what the key thing is that's probably causing this nation to go down the pan? Separating Israel and for taking um, God's land. Yep, could be one of them. Any, any others? Abortions. Abortions, yep, yep. Any others? Yeah, the church moving away from the principles of the Bible. Yeah. Well, what would you reckon the key one is? The key one is prayer. All right, Trace, but you're the pastor. I mean, you're always going to get the right answers. You can get the right answers. It's not fair that you get the right answers and they don't get to have a say. It's like, oh, she got the right answer again. No, you know what it's like in class where that one girl always got all the answers right, okay? You don't want to be that girl. Okay, right. <laughs> So one of the key things in the church today is basically a lack of prayer. The church in the UK, again, in the UK will grow again, but it will not. And I stress this really emphatically. It will not and cannot and will not and cannot and will not and cannot grow until we do the big if. Second Chronicles 7.14. If. And only on the condition of those two letters, I, F, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Right? It's not just pray. OK, you've got to pray. You've got to seek his face and turn from your wicked ways. Then he will hear from heaven and then will forgive our sins and then he will heal our land. Notice how God will do three things if we do three things. OK, so we need to be a people that pray. We need to be a people that seek his face and we need to be a people that turn away from our wicked ways. Now, I, this is what I love about Christianity is that we have a partnership with the living God. 
It's not just all down on us and it's not just up to him. I think if Christians are a little bit too, it's the sovereign move of God, a little bit too far over this count, which is that's God's problem. He'll just do what he wants to do. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum where it's all on us. And if we don't do anything, then God's never going to do anything either. The reality is somewhere in the middle. But we do have this 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 co-laboring to do with God, because guess what? Jesus is not here anymore. He's gone. He went to heaven. He's now here through his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is now down on the earth and he's empowered his church to do what? To do nothing or no, but to go out into the world, preach the gospel. Yes, absolutely. But also to pray because Jesus said in Matthew 6, 9, Matthew 6, 9, pray then like this. This is what Jesus says. Pray then like this. Okay. If you're going to pray, pray like this. All right. Or as another translation to say, say, whenever you pray, pray this. This is why in some church traditions, before they get to their own prayers, the Lord's pray the Lord's prayer. And it says, pray like this. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Sorry, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus has given us this pattern prayer. Firstly, it starts with our Father. It did not say, I, myself, me, Jesus, and Zoom, or God channel, okay? It said, our Father. In other words, there is a place where as Christians, we we need corporate prayer. Now, in our culture, probably, I don't know where it came from, probably the 80s, the big resurgence of the personal devotional quiet time, okay? We, We all do it, we've all got one, okay? But then that became the predominant teaching in the church, didn't it? You must have that, you must have that quiet time with Jesus. You must have that quiet time. So much so that, that the, the, the corporate prayer meetings are now pretty much empty because we don't value corporate prayer. We think my own prayers are what's powerful and what's necessary, my own personal walk with Jesus. But we've lost that connectivity to the wider body and the importance of corporate prayer. Let us, I, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord, okay? It's a, there's a corporate thing there. And in our Western society, the zeitgeist that's come into the church, the spirit of the age, is it's all about me. It's all about my quiet time. Jesus and me, how good he makes me feel, how he affirms me and he shows me how awesome and wonderful I am. Thank you, Jesus. But there is that, there's a truth there. But also, it's you and I, as priests unto God, have a responsibility and a privilege to come together corporately to pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Corporate prayer in the pra- corporate prayer in the, uh, in the UK used to be very strong, especially in the traditional churches. But then after the Second World War, the Church of England um, started slowing down the amount of times they did matins and even song till then it went to like a day or two and then it just became a Sunday thing and then COVID came along and that just boom just stopped most churches from doing any kind of corporate prayer till now only now some churches are starting to do it Um, but it's really important that we come together corporately to pray so as I was praying this week on on this I felt this is what God has given us a little challenge to do okay I'm not going to give you a hard time to make sure you get to the prayer meetings or anything like that. Right? Okay, I'll let you and your, your conscience stew on that one. But what I will say is to start praying the Lord's Prayer just three times a day. OK. Three times a day, say like nine, twelve or three o'clock. OK. Now, I know some of you think, oh, yes, but Christopher, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer is not a prayer, it's a pattern of prayer. Rubbish! If you look at Jesus, the Lord's Prayer, and you look at the prayers that the Jews said at the time, it's exactly the same format as liturgy of its, ta- of its day. So Jesus was taking liturgy of the day, reformatting it and repackaging it in a way so that our, us as Christians and his early Jewish disciples could pray these prayers as a form of liturgy. So yes, it is a, pa- a pattern of prayer, but it is also a prayer. Okay? Why is this prayer important? Uh, as my wife said to me earlier on, it's not some kind of incantation or anything like that. It is a prayer. Okay, you obviously got to engage with it. You've got to be careful. You don't just go, Amen. Right, I've done it now. You've got to engage with it. Think about what you're saying. Okay. I wonder if every one of us in our congregations, okay, could just pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. 9, 12 at 3. And if you forget to do it, just do it three times throughout the day. In the early church councils, they actually demanded that Christians should at least pray it five times a day. 
five times a day. So five times a day. So I'm getting you to do it for three times a day, which is nice and easy, okay? Am I being sarcastic? You know I am. Um, so, okay, so if we could get thousands of Christians every day to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day, I know it would make a difference. Because every prayer is like a drop in a bucket. There you go, a little drop in the bucket there. All right, every prayer is a drop in the bucket. And it'll only be a matter of time before you fill up that bucket. Now, it says in Revelation 5, 8, it says, When he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Your prayers fill up those golden bowls in heaven. And guess what happens when those golden bowls get full? <sighs> and whoosh, throw it down onto the earth so the answer to those prayers will come to pass. Yes. Woo! Hallelujah! All right? I want to see some golden bowls falling out of the sky, especially on this nation. And it means that we have to take responsibility for the state of our nation. It is partly the church's fault. I know there's lots of other things that complain to this, but we need to understand, we need to own this, that the state of our nation is actually in part because of the church. It is the church's responsibility. It says in Ezekiel, if no one will stand in the gap to stay my hand, then God will have to bring judgment. And the church isn't interested in staying God's hand. The church has not been interested in praying for the sins of this land. You know, we need to be a people that really take this on board. And so the challenge is today to help Jesus branch out into this nation again, to help Jesus rebuild his temple in this nation again, because the temple is in decline is that the church needs to pray. And I would just say to, and, and to you guys and everybody listening to this podcast, if we could just pray the Lord's Prayer just three times a day, knowing that when we pray, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying that prayer on behalf of our nation. And we're praying that God's kingdom will come to our nation. Amen. Psalm 133, I'll close with this, teaches that where brothers and sisters are together in agreement, God will command the blessing which is life. And we need the life of God in our church. And I don't care whether you're Anglican or Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or Pentecostal or whatever, we can all pray the Lord's Prayer. You don't have to agree with anybody on it. We can just all pray and we can pray that same prayer. There's unison, there's unitedness, there's harmony, there's brethren praying together in unity and God will bless it. Christ is ready to branch out in this country. He is the branch. He is ready to move. But he is waiting on his church to humble herself to pray. Then and only then will he come and heal our land. Amen. Amen.